So today I'm going to be talking about the kids mobile market from a, a market level and in specifically in terms of monetization models and how they're performing, particularly in the US, but also um, in, East, in Western Europe as well. So if you've never heard of Superdata, we are a New York-based market research firm that provides data and insights on the $75 billion global games market. This includes digital games, but it also includes what we call playable media. So playable media would be anything that, um, that, that facilitates or is facilitated by games like virtual reality, esports, or gaming video content. The way that we do this is by tracking the monthly spending of about 48 million digital gamers across PC, console, and mobile platforms in over 40 key markets. Um, our core product is a subscription service that we call Superdata Arcade, so it's a comprehensive overview of the games market, um, and it's a platform online that you can log into. So my name is Stephanie. Um, what my job is, is to complement the data that we have, design research methods around that, and um, basically explain the why behind the what of the data that our company um, finds. And so my background is in um, research and digital media, both on an academic and professional level. And I've been with Superdata for three years. Um, and so here, you know, we, Specific to the kids' games market, we've been researching it for a couple of years now and trying to understand specifically how it is unique to the mobile market. Um, and you know, we, I don't do this alone, obviously. We have a team of, of almost uh, 20 people who are very intelligent and help me look smart. So looking at the landscape of just digital gaming in general, you know, last year for entertainment, interactive entertainment, which would be digital games and playable media, as I mentioned, grew about 10%, so $75 billion uh, today. And this is happening at a time when we're seeing other forms of entertainment uh, decline. So specifically for the kids market, this is really unique and really important, particularly because of the engagement levels that kids have with interactive entertainment. And this is primarily through mobile games. So looking at the total worldwide market for mobile games for last year, it was $24 billion, um, which is about a third of the total interactive entertainment uh, industry. So the mobile gaming market, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times across many casual connects, it's really big. In North America, uh, that's where we're finding the largest Western market. Um, obviously, Asia is is quite large and the largest. Um, but in terms of kids gaming and monetization, we find a lot of that um, coming forward through North America and Western Europe, which is why those markets are so key and why they're sort of the focal point of this presentation. Looking at the worldwide mobile market uh, and then comparing it to the kids mobile market globally, uh, we see it's about 8% almost for last year of the, the $2 billion, uh, the $2 billion um, I'm sorry, $2 billion kids market of the $24 billion mobile market. And the way that we define kids mobile games is not mobile games just for kids necessarily. It's uh, essentially the revenue that comes from kids. Uh, so we're not just talking about anything you would find in the kids section of the app store which is you know i think an important distinction because there are quite a few games minecraft for example is huge amongst kids and we want to make sure that that's represented and then you know looking at um the u.s mobile games market uh compared to the u.s kids mobile games market it's about a tenth of the market so um we're, we're seeing those games fueled a lot by developed markets like the United States. So we see the overall share, um, you know, is, is lower than in other markets, but primarily in these regions, we're seeing the most growth. And we expect that kids' revenue will grow slowly in maturing markets, but we're, you know, we're looking at markets that are five, ten years behind developed markets. So, you know, Southeast Asia still has a long way to go until we are starting to see kids mobile really become a force over there, for example. 
One of the issues with mobile games in general and kids' games is that marketing has become intense, competitive, and expensive. And so here you can see the trends of cost per install versus the average revenue per user. Um, cost per install continues to grow at a rapid pace. Uh, this is from January 2014 to mid-year 2015. And we're seeing ARPU stay about the same. So you, if you're going to be trying, you know, you're going to be getting your game out there to a certain audience, you need to identify what audience that is, monetize accordingly, and make sure that your app is reaching the right people and you're not spending all of that marketing budget on the wrong places. So the way that I've broken down um, age groups and agency in this presentation, the first is children zero to five years old. This, is the, this demographic is the demographic where parents choose what their children play, by and large. Um, and so the agency comes from the parents. Six to nine, there's sort of a parent-child consensus. So the, the children say what they like, they, they are attracted to certain things, and the parents say yay or nay. And then 10 to 13, they just want to play whatever is cool. They don't really care what their parents want them to play. Um, and this is largely where you see kids veer off away from those kids-specific games. Um, and so, you know, tweens have the most agency when it comes to in-app purchases in particular. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, so with that in mind it's important to see what the preferences are for parents versus children and we, we did a study of u.s kids between the ages of eight and 11 years old and as you can see um, parents want education kids don't care kids want fun so they're looking for outlets for creativity they're looking for um, you know something that's simple and easy to, to get involved with social aspects pretty graphics, those sorts of things are really important. And then all the way small at the top is educational gameplay. So that demographic, obviously they're not as, as, uh, as interested, but they have a lot of agency in what they're playing. So in that case, that's a, an example of when you're marketing to a particular demographic or age base, you want to you want to highlight certain things over others, and maybe this is a demographic you don't make a kids-only game for, for example. Um, and then some of the, the genres that they're most interested in are going to be the, the really um, engaging genres that we see across mobile games. Simulation, action, strategy, a lot of these genres that we, f we find in popularity overall. Um, so looking at, you know, an age group like age 8 to 11, it, we, we see a lot of parallels with the actual uh, mobile games ecosystem. So honing specifically in on U.S. trends, this study was done for the Casual Connect in San Francisco, so a lot of this will be U.S. based. But, um, you know, I can speak to you later if you're interested in learning about other areas. So. There are different types of monetization I think we're all pretty familiar with. The first being uh, premium games. So you pay right away. Maybe, maybe you don't have in-app purchases offered. And then there's free-to-play games. So it's free-to-play, as it says, in-app purchases. Subscriptions are included in this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there's advertising as a way of, of earning revenue outside of in-app purchases. So diving specifically into US premium mobile games revenue um, from kids. Again, this is not from kids apps, this is from kids themselves. We're seeing um, there's, there's this upfront growth uh, that is starting to mature. So for example, you, know, you, have, you have a lot of games that fostered trust in parents early on in terms of that premium model fantastic, but now we're starting to see the premium is just not seeing that growth for a few reasons. One is the fact that the mobile games market is, is essentially saturated everywhere, right? But the other is that parents are sort of looking for other ways to engage, um, to, to, to purchase games in a way that makes them feel um, more trusting. And so you also see in-app purchases are kind of leveling off um, and actually declining by 2017 within premium games and you know a lot of that has to do with I already paid for the game why is my kid asking me to keep paying for the same game so you see that um, 
the the upfront purchases are fairly equal across the different the different demographics but where you find in-app purchase agency is with 10 to 13 year olds so that's where you see the most of that revenue um, coming from so there are a few pros and cons the first being you know a pro is that it's largely regula regulation friendly so copa in the united states or we have um i know there's data protect, uh, protection directive that's being drafted here. There are all sorts of regulations around collecting data on children um, and how to monetize games for children, played by children. So premium really kind of takes that guesswork out of it. It's pretty easy. It's really transparent. Parents know I'm paying once and they're getting the game. Um, and so it's popular. The cons on the other hand are you have a limited revenue stream. Okay, most games, are not Minecraft. They don't get, they don't stay on the, stop, the top charts for months and months and months. So there comes a point where people are paying for your game at a premium price and then you've hit your, your ceiling, your audience ceiling, and that's it. They have short lifespans as a result. Um, and you know this doesn't fund ongoing development and support. So if things break in your game, if you wanna add new content or additional features, You've, they've already given you the revenue that you're gonna get. You know, unless you have in-app purchases and there are those complications, and I'll go into that more with free-to-play, you're really not going to be able to upkeep, um, upkeep the game with a premium purchase. So this is why a lot of game makers look to free-to-play. And um, free-to-play makes two to three times what premium plays uh, makes. The growth, we're still seeing growth, uh, steady growth. Now, keeping in mind that this is revenue coming from kids, free-to-play is continuing to grow in the mobile market at large. Now, in terms of free-to-play games specific to children, that's not necessarily the case. There, um, it's, it's a lot more difficult to list your game as a children's game and have free-to-play purchases. Um, I, I don't have you know, a ton of time to go really in depth with that, but I think most of you who are in the kids mobile games market totally understand why free to play can be tricky in that respect. So if you're going free to play, a lot of times it's better to make an open game that's not particularly for kids, but is attractive to kids. And there are plenty of games that are really popular on you know a global scale. And so we're seeing here again, uh, 10 to 13 year olds really are, are where the the biggest share of revenue is coming from. So 75%, that's most of it. Um, and, and part of the reason, so zero to five, you know, kids at zero to five may not have the agency to ask their parents, or they may not, you know, their parents may not spend six to nine, same thing. So in-app purchases have the highest potential for spending, but they have a lot of difficulties legally and just in terms of agency for children. So you can see that on this page um, a little bit. So there are two types of in-app purchases. There's the consumables, there's the content. Consumables are you know add-ons, currency, anything that sort of adds on to the, the the content that you already can play. And content would be content, right? It would be additional stages, levels, worlds, whatever. And so consumables have the highest potential for spending. This is where we see the most free to play uh, purchases. Ethically, there's a gray area that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's extremely regulated, which is why you know kids games are generally not able to offer this. Um, and it's competing with really big studio games that have the marketing budgets, right? So here you're you're trying to offer a service that large companies with lots of money to spend on CPI um, are also trying to enter. And we're seeing it a lot more um, just in the last six months. The research that we've seen come out of kids studios from, from Nickelodeon or a &E or Disney, the money that's being spent in those areas, it's quite large. So now you're really competing with the big boys. Then there's content, um, so it's re it's much easier to follow regulations. You know, it's kind of similar to subscription, except for it's not necessarily regular. It's transparent. You know, you're getting a level or whatever, um, but it's really hard to make money because, again, it's sort of that premium issue. You're you're just making uh, you're needing to make constant content updates with only a minimal ceiling. You know, you don't have a. a, a you don't have a free-to-play 
uh, opportunity in terms of revenue. You, you have very much a pre somewhat of a premium opportunity. So that can present some revenue issues. So we put subscription into our free-to-play model because a lot of times subscriptions have a free-to-play aspect to it. And then in order to continue playing, you have to pay for a subscription. And so we're seeing, you know, it's still a small sliver of free to play for sure. Part of that is because subscription games generally don't exist outside of the kids genre. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of free to play games that are not kid specific that are taking up some of that revenue for free to play in app purchases. Um, but then you have those kid specific games and the growth is really starting to pick up. So we see from, uh, to, and from 2014 to 2015, it's about a 9% increase, but then um, year over year for 2017, 13%. We really believe that that's going to continue to grow the more that we speak to studios, the more that we see games and um, games that are successful uh, for a number of reasons. So number one is that you start to see that where um, other age groups don't have agency in in-app purchases, they're starting to become much more active in subscriptions, right? So then you have zero to five and six to nine taking up a much larger share of that revenue because parents, they know what they're getting themselves into. They understand that they're going to be billed every month and they don't, um, you know, it's sort of the premium model except for every month there's an understanding that you will receive money and they will give money and there's, there's transparency and regulations are much easier. So um, we're starting to see the subscription model grow a lot for games that are targeted specifically to kids that are under 12, uh, 10, sorry. So back when we did this study in uh, September, these were the top 10 growing kids mobile games in the iOS app store. And so we found that one was free to play with in-app purchases, three were premium uh, with no in-app purchases, but then we found that six were subscription based. Now, of course, this is in the kids category, so this does discount games that are not in the kids category that um, may be directed toward kids but not categorized that way but still this is where parents of zero to nine year old children 10 year old children are going to be looking for games and we're seeing a lot of success come from those so pros and cons pros growing in popularity parents are starting to expect it more and more and are attracted to it it's transparent as I mentioned with premium and it's predictable and recurring revenue and spending on both sides but then the cons are they're really hard to find on Google Play. It's not listed um, in the way that it is on iOS. There's a lot less pricing flexibility. Month to month, it has to be the same price. And if you're going to raise your price, you're going to expect a, a large drop off. And there are a lot of technical limitations. Um, so it, it can be a, a difficult thing to navigate on the development side. So what does this mean for the kids mobile games at large? We're seeing that worldwide uh, kids' revenue is growing at a slower rate than in the United States. This has a lot to do with developing markets, as I mentioned before. So we anticipate in the next five to 10 years, this is going to jumpstart much more once the US evens out, um, or Western Europe and some of these more developed countries, as developing countries begin to come into the fold and spend. And so by next year, the worldwide kids game, kids mobile game revenue market will be $2.2 billion globally um, with 500 million coming just from the US. And so if we break down all of these monetization types, um, you see that the general free to play in app purchases are, you know, games that are not specifically for kids for the most part. So, you know, your plants versus zombies, um, you, the, my, uh, my, sorry, Plants vs. Zombies, you have um, the different games that we're seeing on the top of the list that look cartoony, that are, that are fun and interesting to play, um, Candy Crush, that sort of thing, but are still globally attractive. So it's still on top, but um, then we have kids free to play in-app purchases, so you have the big, big blue bar, then right next to it, you have the kids free to play. And that's just kids games with free to play, right? Games specifically for kids. So there is a huge discrepancy between the two. Um, and then over the next few years, 
we're going to see that general free to play is obviously going to continue to grow. There's nothing that really is going to change that. Um, but in fact, all monetization types are expected to grow for the most part. So uh, the only one is is uh, premium in-app purchases, right? So um, we're seeing that in the in terms of the different monetization types, we're really starting to expect that more and more of these these different games are going to grow. Um, I believe the uh, subscription line is inverted, so um, it will grow at a quicker pace. But uh, all of the rest of them will also continue to grow at quicker and quicker paces, except for premium in-app purchases, which is global. It's in mobile at large as well. So one thing that um, I think is really interesting about the kids' mobile market and will be really interesting in the, in the coming years is we're starting to see how AR and VR are playing into the market. So the Viewmaster has done fairly well. Um, it's a VR, AR device that um, shows kids in a VR environment um, different, different environments that they can explore, and then they can explore it in an augmented reality uh, environment as well. <coughs> And looking at the VR gaming market, um, we're going to see a lot of exponential growth. And, I, and we really believe that much of that is going to come from kids, seeing as there's so much opportunity for kids to become engaged. Kids are extremely um, engaged, and they have a lot of agency in terms of gaming. They want more of that. And so this may be a great opportunity for kids' games to go. Um, so we anticipate. In 2016, by the end of this year, just over $3 billion um, will come in from virtual reality. By the end of 2020, we're looking at $16 billion. So there's, there's uh, a lot of potential in there for all age groups, but we really see uh, young audiences getting a, a lot of, of benefits from that. So. You know, as I mentioned, young audiences are becoming more and more cultivated for agency. They want to be able to interact. They want to be part of the entertainment that they're involved in. And so monetization should also be something that gives payers uh, agency as well. That is my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> do we have any have questions? Question. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. uh, do we have any specifics for Europe? We do. So since... Um, I don't have the numbers here, uh, but we, since this was done for the US market, that's all I have in this uh, presentation. But if anyone is interested, we do have that information. I can email it to you like, immediately. You can email me at stephanie at superdataresearch.com or go to that link. Yeah. And I have, it, I have it right here. So just let me know. Okay. Thank you. F very clear. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh,